40, even 50 live events a month for classrooms to tune into. Head over to exploringbytheseat.com. You can find a listing of all of our events coming up uh, and register for some spots to tune in or join in on camera like some of our classrooms are doing today. So for the month of September, we start off with the theme of ocean plastics. We've been talking to scientists, explorers, artists, uh, filmmakers, photographers from around the world who are documenting the issue, who are researching it, but who are also looking for solutions to this global uh, problem. We're really excited today to be joined um, by Sarah Hudson. Sarah is an award-winning Canadian freelance photographer covering women, conflict, and migration internationally. So she's a National Geographic photographer, and she documented a female-led team of international scientists and engineers on the Sea to Source Ganges expedition. In 2019, they set out on two expeditions with a goal to study plastic pollution in one of the world's most iconic waterways, and Sarah documented the waste they found, the communities they entered in Bangladesh and India. So I'm gonna bring Sarah in with us now. Hey Sarah, how are you doing today? Hi, so nice all right. to meet you all. Great, well great to have you joining us. I believe you're joining us from New York today? That's correct. All right, awesome. Well, first of all, a uh, huge shout out for joining us today. And um, you know, you've, you've been doing some incredible work documenting issues all around the world. And um, it looked like an incredible adventure, the, the Sea to Source expedition. Absolutely. All right. Well, I will let you take over for a little bit. I'll bring in your screen share. And Great. we'd love to, to jump in. OK, perfect. Well, it's wonderful to be with you all today. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you from Brooklyn, New York, which is um, hopefully you won't hear too much street noise. Uh, but that goes with the territory, I guess. Um, so yeah, as Joe mentioned, I'm a Canadian photographer. I uh, am usually based in South Asia. Um, I work around South Asia a lot. Uh, the pandemic has impacted all of our lives, so I've shifted as best as I can. Um, but I'm very excited to talk to you today a little bit about my work and a little bit about how I've been involved in the expedition. So this is me here, this photograph of me and my old camera. Um, this is in South Sudan. And this is me and my old camera in Pakistan. And I share these images with you uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of how it is to kind of um, live and work on the road in different cultures, in different contexts, um, and how one, you know, culturally adapts to those places. And before I really learned about plastics and joined the expedition, I thought I was pretty environmentally conscious myself. Now this next picture will kind of show you that I had a rude awakening. Um, so this is kind of my, because I work with an old camera, I use film and the film comes in plastic wrapping and I have, you know, all of my power bars here and I have my peanut butter and my coffee. Everybody needs their coffee, especially when they're, they're working long hours in kind of challenging conditions. So this was my usual setup. And I thought, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty good. Um, and then I joined uh, this expedition team. And the expedition team uh, is a... It's a female-led, there were some men involved as well who were absolutely wonderful, but it was a female-led um, expedition team from all over the world. And they traveled from the Bay of Bengal, which is in Bangladesh, 
and uh, they, they moved all the way up to the source of the Ganges River. And that is in India, um, around the Himalayas, the mountains. And they wanted to better understand how plastic flows uh, through rivers and waterways and eventually into the ocean. So I learned so much from these uh, incredible scientists and researchers um, while I shadowed them. They were researching, um, they had different teams. Some were researching um, air, some were researching land, some were researching um, part particulate matter in the water. And I was able to join each of these um, different teams to see how they were doing their work. And just to give you a quick um, idea about what the Ganges looks like and where it is, this is a map here and um, it's a little, there are many, many tributaries along the river, but the, the main kind of blue line that starts, it says um, the word Ganga Sagar. Um, so right down there is the Bay of Bengal, and that's where the Ganges um, flows into the ocean. And if you look upwards towards uh, Rishikesh, that's not quite where the source is, but it's getting closer um, to the glacier where the river begins. So just to give you an idea, this is what the river looks like at its near its source, um, near the Gango Tree Glacier. And this is a very pristine, you know, the water looks really clear, it looks really beautiful. It was quite cool because, of course, it's a mountainous area. Um, and, you know, the air was so fresh and it was very pristine and beautiful. And then you get to a scene like this. And this is near one of the main cities in India where the Ganges runs through. This is in a place called Patna Bihar. And not only is plastic a problem for the river, and we're not just talking about the Ganges, we're talking about many waterways that deal with the same problems and the same issues. I, we could even point to the Mississippi River uh, in the United States. And, you know, one would probably be able to compare very similar issues maybe not at the same scale, of course, but, um, you know, so the Ganges, it's been over the past few decades dealing with a lot of chemical pollutants, plastic overpopulation, and this sort of creates this scene of, um, well, for me, it's, it's very kind of tragic um, and very eye-opening. And I think the other thing that's important to mention is that, you know, this is not an over there problem. This is not, oh, this is, this is just the Ganges River. That's way over there. I, I don't even, I've never heard of that. I don't know what that is. That's not my problem. Well, unfortunately, as you can see, and as we are all experiencing throughout the pandemic, we are all vastly connected and every action each of us takes impacts someone else, even if it seems really far away. So I, when I was on the expedition, I was able to learn about, you know, some of the main culprits that um, the research team was looking at. And I learned a lot about plastic fishing nets. I didn't really, I mean, I'd heard that, that fishing nets were an issue, but I hadn't really witnessed it for myself. And so this was something that really intrigued me. And this was close to the Bay of Bengal. This was in Bangladesh. And this is a fishing community. So many people live um, off of, you know, the business of fishing. 
And plastic fishing nets are cheap. And, you know, a few decades ago, cotton used to be used, but because um, plastic has become easily accessible and a lot cheaper, um, fishing communities tend to use what's cheapest. Because, of course, you know, this isn't a high profit business and everybody is really just trying to feed their families. Um, so what we found is that plastic fishing nets were, I believe, 50% of the volume of plastics that are found in the river, which is a very, very large mass. Uh, this is a scene on the Ganges um, near Patna Bihar in India. And it's a very, very beautiful river with a cultural significance that's um, very important to people that live along the river. It's considered very holy for Hindus. And here I will introduce you to Sita Ram Sani and Vinod Sani. And these are uh, fishermen that I was able to spend some time with in India. And this was when I really began to understand, you know, what this, the fishing um, industry means to people living in small villages. And also that, you know, um, replacing plastic fishing nets with something else isn't just a quick solution because many of these people are living in debt. Um, many are, are trying to, to survive and they've all been involved in this business for many, many decades and this is their livelihood. So I spent time with Sita Ramsani, um, who was really the head of the household and his family and this is uh, Vinod, and he's ready to, um, he's, he's preparing to go out onto the Ganges to go fishing, uh, but he has to repair his fishing net before he can do that. And I think they, they did this just about every day that I was there. Um, these fishing nets are not very durable and they break a lot and so there's hours being spent just trying to repair the nets. This was at the Sita Ramsani's home and these are his grandchildren and these are kind of for me personally my favorite moments um, just when I'm able to spend time with the family, get to know the family, um, and really understand their lives. Uh, this is um, at the school of Sita Ramsani's uh, grandchildren. And this is one of Sita Ram's sons, who uh, they spent a long night out on the river. And um, some of them, I found two of them actually, um, who had decided to sleep on the boat. I think because it gets quite warm, we are, we are near Bihar, which um, can become very, we are in Bihar, um, near the capital of, of Patna, and it can get very, very hot, uh, very hot. And I think also some of the homes are quite crowded. So a few, a few of them, I think, take naps outside on the boat. It's airy, you know, it's probably <laughs> a lot quieter than being inside a home with babies and cooking and all sorts of things going on. So life really exists along this river. It's, it's a very important um, source for people. And the other thing that I thought would be interesting to share is in terms of, you know, in the United States, we have kind of a, a formal recycling system where we know, okay, this plastic bottle goes in this bin. If we're conscious enough, we also compost. 
and we try to decrease our use as much as possible. But in places like India and Bangladesh, there is not a formal recycling system. So there are people, um, and the term they use, I don't, I'm not a big fan of. Um, so I will just call these people employees, um, service workers, who actually uh, go home to home. Some of them go home to home, and then some of them go to uh, landfills, sites where garbage is dumped, and they actually pick out the plastic bottles. And these plastic bottles are then um, recycled. And there's a whole system that is, um, it's not formal, it's not streamlined like the United States, but these service workers here um, are vital to recycling some of the uh, most destructive plastics like PPE bottles. Um, I know that I'm going a little bit, uh, I should probably hurry a little bit here, um, but this is in um, Patna, Bihar, and this um, is one of the landfills. And there are children who are um, part of this system. These children are obviously having a joyful moment and I thought it was really beautiful because they had set up this swing um, <laughs> where they all played together and were laughing and really finding a lot of joy in their situation and I just loved seeing that. And I wanted to share this as well. Um, you know, this is a scene that was quite close to the source of the river uh, in Rishikesh. And, you know, it's, it's the, the river is flowing quite heavily, uh, but you still see these scenes where plastic and other textiles and waste are, are getting stuck on the rocks. So you can imagine what's happening under the surface and what's happening to the biodiversity that exists in the river. If you can see this, this happening on the surface, imagine what's happening below the surface. Oh, and I thought I'd <laughs> just share these little moments because yes, we're out there, we're capturing these stories and it's all very serious and important and all of this. And, but at the same time, we have to have these moments of joy. Um, and connection. And really that's the most important part. And so here on the left, I am, I met a, um, a couple in Harshal Uttarkhand, which is very near the glacier of the river. And they wanted me to put on their traditional clothing. So I obliged. <laughs> and um, on the right, I met this very lovely man um, and I'm forgetting his name because I can't see my notes right now. Um, but he was so warm and lovely. And he said, um, the river is my, is like my mother. And I thought that was such a beautiful quote and so true for, for many people that live along the Ganges. It's, they worship it like, like it is their mother. And... Here is a sadhu, uh, which is um, a holy man. Um, and you find, you know, many of these um, individuals who kind of are not necessarily authentic. Um, they, they try to um, enlist offerings from tourists. Uh, this particular holy man I felt was very authentic. He sat with me and my translator for a few hours and he just shared his thoughts on the river and how sad it made him to see all the changes. He said that the river used to be much larger, there used to be so much more water, now it's very small um, <clears throat> and he said the only thing he, he would wish is that it would become beautiful again. 
this is one of the scenes in Varanasi, one of the holiest cities in India. And this is also in Varanasi um, at a flower market. And you see these little sparkly items here. These are weaved into the flowers and those are actually plastic items. And when people make offerings to the river, which they do uh, daily for prayer, it's part of their ritual, they sometimes um, toss these flowers into the river as an offering. Um, and many people don't realize that this is actually um, hurtful. Of course, people don't want to hurt the river because they love the river and they worship the river, um, but they're unaware that that these little plastic items are actually quite harmful. Um, and there's a lot of movement around activism and religion, religious leaders becoming more vocal about the threats to the river, um, but there's still, there's still a lot more to be done. And I, oh, sorry, I will end here on this last image. Um, this is in Varanasi, India, and this is um, along the, the Ganga, it's called in um, Hindi, in India, it's called the Ganga. And uh, devotees here are pledging to protect the river. They do this every night on the river. They pledge to protect her um, and they pledge not to throw plastic into the river. So that was a hopeful scene that I thought I would end on. All right. Very cool, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing those images uh, from the expedition with us. You know, it's it's awesome to see, you know, not just the river, but the people who, who live along the river and, and rely on the river and hear how passionate they are about it. So, um, you know, it must be a struggle. On one hand, they need things like the plastic you know, for fishing and, and maybe food and such. But uh, on the other hand, they know what it's doing to the river. So it must be, must be a bit of a struggle with, with not a lot of alternatives. Absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look back at um, traditional India and Bangladesh, many people, you know, they, plastic was not part of their daily lives at all. Um, they were very kind of close to the source um, but because these convenience items became readily available, it became cheaper for people. This is, this is the option that's, that's there. Um, but folks <clears throat> are becoming more and more uh, aware of what it's doing. Yeah. Well, it was great to see those pictures, uh, you know, close to the source, kind of have a picture of the Ganges as this big, powerful river, but you know, you hear a lot about how, how polluted it has become, but it's, it's nice to see those pictures of the source and see um, that pristine part of the country. Very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, let's bring in a few groups. Let's get some questions worked in here. So, Great. Uh, all right. Let's go to our first group. We have, they're joining us in Burlington, Ontario, Canada. They're a grade eight class. They're uh, joining us virtually as many classes have to. Uh, these days with Miss Molinares. Let me bring them in. All right, uh, Miss Molinares, if you want to unmute for me, we'd love to grab a question. Hi there, Joe. Hi, Sarah. Thanks Hi. for sharing your research with us. Um, we're mm -hmm. just wondering about next steps. So now that you have this information and you've shared some information with us as well, do, do you and your team have some next steps planned? Yeah, so I, as a storyteller, my next steps are different from the expedition. Um, I'm working with National Geographic magazine. I'm hoping, um, knock on wood here, uh, to go back to India and continue working on this uh, story. And the next sort of portion or chapter of this project will be looking at environmental activism and people who are really involved in um, fighting the destruction of the river. And this includes religious leaders. Um, so, you know, as, as a storyteller and photographer, that's my next step and my next hope. The research team is um, 
they are, I believe, hoping to come out with their findings in the spring or summer. I think things have been delayed because of everything going on. Um, and they're also hoping to do this research on other rivers. So, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what those are, but I know there was discussion about the Yangtze, you know, some of the main, the main rivers that we hear about in the top 10 list. Um, but in terms of sort of solutions, I know they're, the team is working really hard with um, their partners in Bangladesh and in India to develop um, some of these solutions. And, and we'll certainly, you know, if you're interested, we can certainly share some of those papers with you when they come out. All right. Good question to get us started. We're going to take a little trip to Florida now. We've got Salgado representing her high school students. Let's bring them to the call. All right. We're ready for you. Hi. Um, uh, one of my kids was out wondering, um, how, what is the most, um, I guess, a challenging or a rewarding experience you've had on this trip? Oh, that is such a great question. Um, oh man, that's, that's kind of hard to, to pinpoint. I would say, so in the beginning of the expedition, we, we did it twice. Um, so one was done before what's called the monsoon season, where in South Asia and other parts of Asia, it's, if folks don't know what the monsoon is, it's a very rainy period of time of about three or four months. So the research team went out before the monsoon um, and then after the monsoon to see if there were any variables in their research findings. And in the first uh, part of the expedition, we started in Bangladesh um, near the Bay of Bengal. And we spent, I believe, or I spent, I think, 12 days um, on a boat. We, so we all lived on a boat <laughs> and I believe the team spent longer, um, but it was this wonderful um, kind of, I wouldn't say it was like, no, not at all luxurious by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it was also a heat wave. So, and I can only uh, work in Celsius. So I don't know Fahrenheit, but there were days where it was 51 degrees Celsius and we were living on this boat. Of course, there's no air conditioning and we're all just in this situation together flowing up the river. And I will never forget that experience. It is something that I will take to, you know, the end of my life. All right. Great experience. We've got uh, Akash is joining us in India. He's joining via YouTube. And he's curious as to, may, maybe you know the answer to this, why was the, the Ganges chosen as the first river, the first river to visit? Such a good question, Akash. Um, I don't see Akash here. Okay, that's okay anyway. Um, yes, that's a really wonderful question. And I think, um, the expedition, the expedition team would answer by saying, you know, it's such an important river. It's 400 million people live along the river. They survive along this river culturally. It's very vibrant and significant. Um, you know, India and Bangladesh are both very important countries in the global uh, economic and political and social scene. And I think as well, partners in Bangladesh and India were very keen. You know, they were, they wanted to partner, they wanted to do this research. Um, so it all kind of worked together to, to make um, a welcoming first uh, expedition. But of course the team wants to study other rivers, um, but the Yangtze, you know, because China I think there would be probably issues getting permission with that. And so there are lots of things to consider. Okay, I'm gonna bring Sharisa into the call. Uh, Sharisa, if you have a question, go ahead uh, and ask. Oh, 
Hi. Hi. Um, I was wondering if you could tell me what you, your, your photography is beautiful. Um, and I really enjoyed some of the pictures that you took of the domestic life. I was wondering if you could share with us um, one of your one experience with your uh, with some of the domestic life that that you felt really moved you. One of my favorite experiences was that the question. Sorry, I think my screen froze. Oh, that's okay. It happens. Yeah, I think so. It's something uh, maybe that impacted you from taking those photos uh, of those kind of experiences and being yeah, in people's sorry, I think, Yeah, sorry. I think my I froze a bit. Yeah. No problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of... Yeah. Um, again, such a such a wonderful question. I think my, hmm, I'm such an empathetic and sensitive person. So I feel like every person I meet and every interaction I have really moves me. And, you know, honestly, it's such a privilege to do what I do and for people to let me into their homes. So I would start there by just saying like, what a privilege to be invited into anyone's home. And that's, you know, what, what a gift. Um, but I would say Sita Ram, the, the portrait I shared of Sita Ram Sani and his, um, his nephew Vinod, I think the, my most favorite time, and there weren't any images in there, unfortunately, that I shared, but um, their wives uh, were, were so, <laughs> they were very playful. And um, I would just kind of hang out with them while they were cooking and they were getting their kids ready for school. And I just, sometimes I just sit there. I don't even take um, photographs because, you know, you're a stranger in someone's home and you're trying to, um, get them to feel comfortable with you. And me Hindi bolti thori bahut. I speak a little bit of Hindi, but not much. So yeah, I mean, my favorite moments that I recall on this past trip were, were spending time with, with the women of the household and laughing with them about the absurdity of this, um, this foreign person with a weird camera, just kind of sitting there expecting to, um, capture their lives in these very intimate moments. Um, but we all laughed a lot and it was really great. And yeah, I cherish those moments. There we go, fix that mic. Do you find that the, that's an important tool, uh, you know, coming in and sitting and listening first before you approach uh, with the camera to take some images? Yeah, very much so. Um, I. I teach a little bit um, through the International Center of Photography. And one of the first things that I share with people is, and I, I think through portraiture, you can kind of do this. Um, but for me, I can't imagine just kind of dropping into someone's home and expecting them to understand like why I'm there, why the stranger is there and, and expect them to reveal themselves to me and my tool. Um, they have to trust me and I have to trust them. So it's a very uh, intuitive, careful dance, just um, being kind, being empathetic, being slow. Um, the good thing about working with National Geographic is that they do, you know, they give you time and, and they give you time because they know that that's so important that you need to really sit with people and gain their trust and watch them, observe them and let them get comfortable with you. All right, so let's check in with our virtual grade eight class in Burlington and see if they have a follow-up question. Hi, Sarah. We have a few questions. Some of them you've answered as you've gone along. Um, we're really interested in the fact that there are some overlapping lenses here. So the fact that there's 
the economic well-being of the families that you've met. There's also the spiritual beliefs and then the environmental piece. And we think you captured that really in an interesting way with your photos. Um, on the on the topic of photos, some of our students are wondering about your other experiences that you've had. What are the interesting or even crazy things that you've done to get photos is what some people are asking. I'm not sure I should share this with the, with the classroom. No, I'm just kidding. Um, and I mean, I don't encourage everyone to be a photographer because I think it, it requires an incredible amount of dedication and um, risk taking. I, you know, I've worked across South Asia. I've worked in um, parts of Africa and South Sudan, in Uganda, in Kenya. Um, I've worked in South America, and I found myself in some pretty precarious situations. Um, I've stayed in some pretty precarious situations. Uh, and, you know, I've also, I've had dengue fever, I've had malaria, I've had dis I've had all these kinds of things. Um, so I, I mean, there isn't one location or story that feels riskier than another. It's that you have to believe that this story that you want to tell and that you are using your tool for is, it, you know, it's worth telling, it's worth risking yourself for and also the people that you're, you're working with because they're also taking a risk by, by sharing their stories. But I will say, you know, like I've jumped on and off of moving trains. <laughs> I've climbed things, I've gone into like landfills, you know, I've been bitten by animals, like all kinds of things that I could go on and on about that are not at all luxurious. Um, but I love the adventure and I love the risk. Absolutely. And some stories need to be told or need to be told, right? Need to, to shed a light in areas um, that we don't often see kind of in our bubble sometimes here in North America. Absolutely. All right. Let's check back in and see if there's another question. Oh, I think Ms. Delgado may have frozen. Uh-oh. Just wait for a second. Okay, well, while we wait to see if she unfreezes, uh, another question came in via YouTube, wondering about, um, you know, where, what kind of influenced you to choose this career, this storytelling? What influenced me? Yeah. Yeah, such a great question. Um, Mm, I actually came into photography pretty late. I was 30. Um, I studied a lot. I did a master's in international conflict. And then I worked for a nonprofit organization um, in, on the border of um, northern Uganda and South Sudan. And that's how I sort of kind of intuitively got into storytelling photography through this NGO work, um, you know, and I, I found that I, w I wanted to be out there uh, speaking to people and telling their stories much more than I wanted to be working for an organization, you know, telling people that this is how they should improve their lives. Um, and I will also say that I grew up with you know, people who were very politically involved and activists and father um, wrote several books on, you know, Aboriginal self-government in Canada. And, and so I, from a young age, I was exposed to um, social issues and political issues. All right. Well, I love that you share that with us because you know, if there's one reoccurring theme on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants from talking to scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists all over the world is there is no one path to get into a certain career. Um, yeah. Life changes, interests change. Uh, you know, you might start one area and find a path, something that you're so passionate about. 
uh, you have to go after, after it. So I'm um, really glad that you shared that story, Sarah. I think that's so important for students to hear is that sometimes, uh, you know, it takes a bit to find what you what you want to do. And sometimes it just hits you and, and, and you go for it. So very cool. All right. Well, a huge shout out to the groups joining us today. Thank you for our camera classes. Thank you for our groups tuning in via YouTube and Facebook. And Sarah, the biggest thank you of all to you, of course. Thanks for taking some time uh, to join us today and share your experiences on the Ganges. Um, again, looked like an incredible uh, expedition. And fingers crossed that the whole team, we posted Jenna and Imogen and uh, Lilligal in the past, and, and we hope that the team can get back out there and, and bring these important issues uh, to us. I hope so too. Thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure to share my experience and work with you. All right. Awesome. Well, again, thanks everybody for joining us today and we are going to sign off for now. Thank you so much.